Hello, and I'm glad you're making time to watch this video. I believe it carries a very important message for the church. If this is the first time you're watching, we'll have some worship music. Feel free to sing along in your living room. We'll have a time of communion so you can prepare for that. Press pause and go do that if you need to, and then I'll talk for a little bit. Let's pray, and then we'll begin with some music. God, we love you so much as we continue forward after this holiday season, I pray that we would continue to focus on you as we have for the past few days, that you would always be the number one focus in our lives and that we would always be telling people not only about the birth of Jesus, but about the life, death, and resurrection of Jesus, because that is what our faith is built on. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I'm not a warrior I'm too afraid to lose I feel unqualified for what you're calling me to The Lord with your strength I've got no excuse Cause broken people are exactly who you use So give me faith like Daniel as God's church is in the fact that we believe he'll continue to move mountains and he'll continue to change lives. Now, as we move from music to meditation and self-examination, I want to read from Paul's letter to the Colossian believers. Beginning at verse 15, the author writes these words, Words that I believe we should hold in our hearts as we celebrate our time of communion. The Son is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn over all creation. For in him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or powers or rulers or authorities, all things have been created through him and for him. He is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead, so that in everything he might have the supremacy. That's who Jesus is. He's the one who reigns supreme in everything and over everything. Now, I want to put these next two verses on the screen because, to me, they can be confusing. The words you'll see in italics and parentheses are mine. For God was pleased to have all his, meaning all God's, fullness dwell in him, meaning in Jesus, and through him, Jesus, to reconcile to himself, God, all things whether things on earth or things in heaven, by making peace through his, Jesus' blood shed on the cross. The words his, him, and himself referred to a couple of different entities in those verses. The words you in these next verses refer to, well, you, personally, if you are a follower of Jesus. And let me tell you, that's good news. Once you were alienated from God and we were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior. But now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free from accusation. If you continue in your faith established and firm and do not move from the hope held out in the gospel. When you're eating the bread and drinking from the cup in remembrance of Jesus, 
Remember that his blood has reconciled with you reconciled you with your creator God. And as the music plays, do this in remembrance of all of that. again. God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you for the communion, for this simple yet intimate way for us to remember the sacrifice that was made on our behalf. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. I want to start by pointing out something about the songs that we played at the opening of the service. While they focus on the confidence that we have in and through our relationship with Jesus, and they focus on that confidence in different ways, there's another common reference in them that looks at something from two different angles. In the first song, the lyrics say, I'm going to sing and shout and shake the walls. I won't stop until I see him fall. Obviously a reference to the walls of Jericho that we read about in the Old Testament. In the second song, the artist sang, Walking around these walls, I thought by now they'd fall. Same walls, different perspective. In the first, I'm not giving in until the walls fall. In the second, though still confident, I'm wondering why the walls haven't fallen yet. The difference is what I want to talk about this morning. And yes, we're going back to the pages of the ancient scriptures, the Old Testament. And yes, we're going back to the book of Joshua where the account of the battle for and the fall of Jericho is found. There are stories in the book of Joshua that will probably ring a bell for you. This is the time in the history of God's people when Moses has now died and Joshua is the new leader of the Israelites. After 40 years of wandering in the wilderness, the people of God are preparing to enter the promised land. If you're familiar with this book of the Bible, you'll remember that before they cross the river into the promised land, they send spies, two of them actually, to do reconnaissance. They went to scope out the situation to see what they're walking into. One of the things made clear in that part of the story is that the person, the unlikely person who offers them aid in their spy work is identified as Rahab, the prostitute. What we can draw from that is God uses who God chooses. 
She hides the spies, protecting them from the king and his men. And they made a deal with her that because she had done that for them, she and her family would be spared when God and the Israelites take over Jericho. So we're going to pick up the story as the two spies head back to report to Joshua. The last two verses of Joshua chapter 2 say this. Then the two men started back. They went down out of the hills, forded the river, and came to Joshua, son of Nun, and told him everything that had happened to them. They said to Joshua, the Lord has surely given the whole land into our hands. All the people are melting in fear because of us. I included that part because I want you to put one thing in the back of your mind for now. I want you to remember that it says the men forded the river. That's not an insignificant detail, and we'll see why in just a minute. Now we're going to be moving on to chapter 3 of the book of Joshua. After arriving at the bank of the river Jordan, Joshua and the people have camped out for three days. We start reading now as plans are made to cross the river. Joshua 3, beginning at verse 2. After three days, the officers went throughout the camp, giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go since you've never been this way before. But keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits between you and the ark. Do not go near it. By the way, 2,000 cubits is about three football fields. Or 3,000 feet. So they'll be watching from a distance. Then Joshua said this to the people. Consecrate yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do amazing things among you. In my humble opinion, those are the most important words we read in this account. And the reason for that is because of the word consecrate. That's definitely a religious word. I doubt you can think of a time when you've used or heard the word consecrate outside of this context. The definition of the word is this, to make or declare sacred, set apart or dedicate to the service of a deity. The definition alone, by the way of reference to a deity, makes this a religious word. What makes it very a very important word to us in this context is the way it's used. The online reference that I use, dictionary.com, gives us an example of the, of the use of this word to consecrate a new church building. That's an accurate and proper use of the word and it may be what comes to mind when we in the year 2020 think of consecrating something, setting something apart, dedicating something to be used in the service of a deity, which in this case would be God. In our text, however, it's the people themselves that are to be consecrated. That puts a whole new twist on the word, doesn't it? Joshua isn't talking about setting objects aside for use in the service to God. He's telling the people that they are to make their very existence, their very lives, set apart for God. What I really like is the reason he gives for that. When they cross this river, God's going to do amazing things in their lives. Here's takeaway number one for today. Church, I will boldly say without doubt or reservation that if we, the people of God, will consecrate ourselves, if we'll set ourselves apart, living for God's purpose and for God's glory, we will see him do amazing things among us.
I want to read on just a little more so we can see other things that we can apply to our lives. Verse nine, starting at verse 9, it says, Joshua said to the Israelites, Come here and listen to the words of the Lord your God. This is how you will know that the living God is among you, and that he will certainly drive out before you the Canaanites, Hittites, Hivites, Perizzites, Girgashites, Amorites, and Jebusites. See, the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord of all the earth will go into the Jordan ahead of you. And as soon as the priests who carry the Ark of the Lord, the Lord of all the earth, set foot in the Jordan, its waters flowing downstream will be cut off and stand up in a heap. Now, the Jordan is at flood stage all during harvest. Yet as soon as the priest who carried the ark reached the Jordan and their feet touched the water's edge, the water from upstream stopped flowing. The priest who carried the ark of the covenant of the Lord stopped in the middle of the Jordan and stood on dry ground while all Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing on dry ground. Okay, I'm sure many of you have made the connection even if you've never read the book of Joshua, really even if you've never read the Bible at all, because of television and Hollywood and motion pictures, you've heard of Moses and the parting of the Red Sea. This sounds very familiar, and guess what? After 40 years in the wilderness, this is the same group of people that crossed when the Red Sea was parted. Many of the older generation had died, but there has to be a sudden sense of deja vu for some. And the rest at least know the old story of the Red Sea. It's as if God is showing that his power and faithfulness have not diminished at all as they wandered in the wilderness. It's as if he's saying he's the same God who delivered them from captivity. If you read on into chapter 4, you'd see that immediately upon the priests and the Ark of the Covenant stepping back onto the bank of the river, the water started flowing again. That would be familiar to them as well, because we know when the Red Sea was parted and the whole nation crossed over, once they landed on dry ground, the Egyptians were swallowed as the water began to flow again. You, also read that, you would also read that God kept every promise he's made to his people concerning the promised land. Here's your takeaway number two. Once you've experienced God, it's much easier to recognize God when he shows up again. Before I wrap things up, I want to go back to what I asked you to tuck away in the back of your mind a minute ago. Do you remember what that was? I asked you to remember that the text in chapter 2 tells us that the spies forded the river. They walked through it. Now, that causes a question for me. Why do you think God would stop the flow of the river one time and not the other time. Wouldn't it have been easier for the people, the people in the nation of Israel to cross the river as a group, holding on to one another with the water flowing, than for the two spies to cross the river on their own with the water flowing? That seems realistic to me, especially considering that we were told that the water was at flood stage when this all took place. If you've heard me preach before, you know I don't usually ask questions without having at least an opinion of an answer. In this case, I believe the spies had to cross through the water because the idea to send spies in the first place was Joshua's idea and not God's idea. How do I know that? After the death of Moses, as Joshua is chosen by God as the next leader of the Israelites, the first thing God says to Joshua is this, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now then, you and all these people get ready to cross the river Jordan into the land I am about to give to them, 
to the Israelites. He doesn't say anything about sending an advance spy reconnaissance party. He simply says, get ready to cross the Jordan River. Here's your final takeaway for today. Why don't we just follow God's plan and quit making it harder than it has to be? Let's pray. God, we love you so much. Again, we thank you for the opportunity to worship. We thank you for your word and the lessons that come from it and how we can apply that to our lives today. Because even after all this time, we're still people and things haven't changed all that much. Things look much different in our world today. But I am convinced that the more they change, the more they and you and your son Jesus stay the same. And I thank you for that. And I pray in Jesus' name. Amen.